Thank you. Okay, everybody, welcome to tonight's share. Thank you all for coming. Tonight is num program number 58 with Coach Benachem, Let's Get Real. And again, I always start off with thank you everybody for coming every single week. And the way the program grows is by people putting it on their statuses, emailing people, letting people know about it. We really appreciate it. We get a tremendous amount of feedback. And I want, again, I want to thank everybody for the week for coming. Every Sunday night, it's the same place. Zoom share at 10 o'clock. All those who are watching the replay of this video on YouTube, please click on Menachem's uh, like button, smash the like button, subscribe to his channel so you get every week a new video and you can be part of this amazing, amazing program. I want to first start off with thanking our advertising sponsors, the Lakewood School here in Lakewood. Thank you for both for wanting to here so strongly. And a special thank you to Robbie and Yanit from Chazak. Chazak offers programming from all. I was actually very busy with them today on the phone. They got our next week's speaker today. We'll get to that in a second. And I give a special thank you to Chayla Kaufman and School Summer from JCM from Eric Sisrell, my good, good friend, for always promoting us across all the digital platforms. Again, we really appreciate it. Again, every Sunday night here at 10 o'clock, this is Zoom ID. We have different shiurim, rabbanim, topics, therapists. So please try to come. If you can't come, spread the word. Next week, June 13th, Sunday, we have an amazing program. We just locked up today. Moshe, you ready for this? You know what's coming on? Not Moshe Norman, somebody else. We have Rabbi Daniel Katz from Ish HaTorah from Eretz Yisrael. He's an unbelievable guy, very interesting. Uh, we just confirmed today, we're discussing how to clear out our emotional blockages. He has the magic trick and come next week and he'll figure it out. Um, it's gonna be an amazing program. Please tell everybody about it. And um, I watched a few of his videos today. I was blown away, so it should be amazing. Again, we have this host tonight of having two of the biggest therapists with us tonight in the field. And uh, somebody texted me today, why do you need two therapists? I said, because one usually gives therapy to the other. So that's why we brought two on tonight to help each other out. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have Moshi uh, Norman, a very good friend of mine here at Lakewood, or the young Tepfer from Cedarhurst. Thank you for coming on. And before we get started, let's turn to our host, Coach Menachem. Divir Pesicha, open it up. Thank you so much. Really exciting tonight's program with the, like we heard, the two Chashavah therapists, Moshi Norman and Binyam Tepfer. Both, like I say, each one individual could have a whole program of three, four hours, but we're going to have to try to put everything in with the two therapists. Tonight's topic, making the most of our relationships. So the truth is if you live in a room all by yourself and you don't see people around, you do everything on your own with no one involved, then tonight's program is not for you. The, no relationships involved, that's fine. But if you do go out of your house, it just starts right there. Wherever you go, there are relationships. Again, there are different level of relationships, but you talk to your neighbor, you talk to people in the shul, you're talking to uh, your in-laws, spouse, kids, wherever you go, this, this topic is, is very broad, so, you know, relationships. And what, you know, what, what I'm thinking is that usually you can walk away if they don't agree. The guy in the shul sits in your seat and you're not happy, so you just walk away. Hopefully he doesn't do it again or whatever. But there's two places where you can't, two places, there's more than two, but two what I'm thinking is, uh, where it gets a struggle. Number one is shalom bias. At the end of the day, you got to work things out. If you, you you want blue and she wants red, you have to figure it out. It's not going to last. And number two is by partners. At the end of the day, who is getting this money? If you don't figure this out, if you don't figure it out, or at work, co-workers, you know, who's going to get the work done? You'll throw it on your co-worker. And after, after a while, it's not going to work. So again, it depends on the levels of relationship um, that you need to learn the skills that we will hear tonight about communication. I just want to mention one aspect of communication is effective listening. Uh, I think they did a study that came out that um, only 7% of, of, of the communication is verbal. The words that the person is telling you it's just 7% of what he's trying to say. The other one is the facial expressions and there's so much, so, so much emotions behind it. So that's where the emotional, you gotta be really intelligent, emotional intelligent to understand what the other person is saying so that you can interact and have that communication. They say a joke that people in, in, in yeshiva, when they learn a katois or whatever they're learning, a is, is, is thinking of his mahalach, and B is thinking of his mahalach. And A is trying, no, mine is right. And B says, no, mine is right. But A did not hear what B said, and B didn't hear what A said. Everybody's busy with the way they're thinking. 
Effective listening is to be able to be quiet and listen to what the other person is saying. The words, yes, the words he's saying, how he says it and what he's trying to say. So that's only one aspect. And again, how to say no, how to accept a no. Um, the people pleasers need to understand that you're gonna try to please everybody out there and say yes, yes all day, but it's not gonna last too long. So Amit Shem tonight with our Two Chashavah therapists, Mr. Shem, we will get to learn some ideas, skills, so we can take along in Mr. Shem. So I thank, I want to thank you both for coming here tonight with us. Thank you so much. Uh, Menachem, beautiful thank you for that opening. First, I want to start off with tonight's sponsor. Tonight's show is sponsored by Recovery at the Crossroads. Recovery at the Crossroads is the only inpatient treatment center in the tri-state area that are licensed co-occurring treatment facilities, which means they're licensed to not only treat substance abuse, but any underlying mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, or trauma. They've been working around 15 plus years and they help many from families and put tremendous effort in working together with the family. If anyone you know is struggling with addiction, feel, please feel free to reach out to them at 888-466-5950. Menachem, where are they located? I thought they're in Florida. I thought they're in China, <laughs> so the tri-state area. So if anybody knows anything, we're, working, we're actually working with them on a few different people. We're gonna make a very big uh, addiction program with them. So stay tuned, we're working on, as we're putting it together. We're gonna to start off first with our first uh, therapist, Dr. Biyam Tefer, I'm gonna read his bio, and then you'll open it up and then we'll give it to Moishi. Dr. Biyam Tefer, PhD, C-A-S-T and a bunch of other letters, is the founding director of Arbor Intensities and in Integrative IOP in Brooklyn, New York, which specializes in the treatment of trauma, behavioral health and emotional wellness. He also serves as a supervisor with the International Institute for Trauma and Addiction Professionals, while maintaining a private practice in Cedarhurst, Brooklyn and in Lakewood, Open it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be on and um, a real honor. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, an evening together with everyone who, who has just joined. Um, there's more communication that is going on right now in the world, in all of our lives, than there's ever been in the history of the world between the texts, chats, WhatsApps, Instagrams, Facebooks, emails, voicemails, and we can go on and on. We're bombarded all day with communication. And the irony is I sit with people and with couples, um, and if I can say the one emerging theme that is, is such a prevalent uh, thing these days is the aspect of loneliness, the aspect of still feeling somehow so either misunderstood or detached or lonely within a relationship. And these two things somehow are coexisting in the uh, current uh, world that we live in. I don't feel that anyone really understands me or my wife doesn't get me at all. My husband can come and I can ask him what happened. And eh, it was a regular day, it's fine, it was good. I can't get him to actually talk to me, to, to share about you know what's going on. He comes home from shul, what happened in shul? What do you think? Oh, oh. And I don't feel like I have any you know, part of his life. That's the world um, that, that we find ourselves bombarded on one hand by communication, but somehow lost uh, trying to connect. Even as we're taking off our masks and uh, we're, we're, we're stopping somehow the social distancing, somehow we still feel like we're hiding and we still feel so detached from one another. So that's tonight's topic. So now how do we get from a world of aloneness and disconnection to a world of connection and vacation. Some to try to understand that. There was, a, I want to start, there was a, a young, a family of young children who uh, lost their father. This goes back a uh, hundred plus years in Yerushalayim. And uh, the famous Shmuel Salant went to be Menach Mavel. And he sits down in front of the young children and he begins to talk to them and he asks them about their father and sits there for a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and gets up, finds 
he finds his way to the door and his shamash and him leave. And he asks him, you know, what happened there was strange. You know, you're supposed to wait for the children to first talk and then you're supposed to uh, respond to start. And his answer was really the opening of tonight's talk. He said, you didn't hear what I heard right when I sat down. You didn't hear them screaming. You didn't hear them crying. You didn't hear them telling me all the pain that they were going through. Then you weren't listening. And that's what Coach Menachem was talking about a couple of minutes ago. We're, we're communicating a lot. But the problem is not that we're not communicating. Our communication is somehow so shallow. Somehow it's so superficial. We're sharing a lot of information with one another, but we're not communicating to one another, which means to be truly known by another person and to truly know another person is what we're going to try to crack open a little bit uh, tonight. Now, the challenge is that this is touching on our greatest fear. Our greatest fear is if you, you really know I am, then you'd never love me, then you'd never accept me, then you'd never be my friend. So therefore, I'm afraid somehow of going really to, to an authentic, vulnerable, open type of communication. My biggest pain is that I've had situations where there was someone I thought who knew me very well, but he somehow or she somehow rejected, criticized, or betrayed me. So therefore, it's very, very tempting for all of us to play it much, much safer than that. And there are many, many ways to play it very safe, to not really share anything real, to somehow blame other people, or you can become you know, a people pleaser. There was a famous scene that some of us may be familiar with. Uh, the, the scene goes where the, the fellow was being interviewed in court and he said, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. And th there's, a, there's a truth to that, that we somehow are, are either afraid or we've been hurt by that. But the, the other, on the other hand, the reality is that we also know that our greatest joy, our greatest and deepest healing, and the thing that we want the most in the world is for someone to truly know us and not just despite that, but because of that, accept us, want us, desire us, love us even more. That's what we're really, really craving most. And that requires what we were talking about before. It requires these two big ingredients. Number one, it requires being known making ourselves, allowing ourselves, opening ourselves up to letting another person truly know the parts of me, my life. And that doesn't happen with just sharing, you know, uh, you know, the superficial details of what's going on. So I get you off my back. But to open up truly, there was a, a, a book um, many years ago, I, I came across fellow by the name of Matthew Kelly. He wrote The Seven Levels of Intimacy. And he talks there, you can, you can live your life with cliches, cliches with some facts, even with some opinions, then with feelings, and then with talking about a person's you know, own struggles and your own strengths and your dreams, one layer deeper than the other, deeper than the other. A person to really, really open open up, that, that requires real vulnerability. And that requires a rawness, a certain, um, you know, uh, confidence and vulnerability to really allow oneself to be fully known. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a, a thought from a famous saying from the Baal Shem to, it says, Boyal HaTeva, that Hashem told Nayak to, to come into the Teva. And the word Teva doesn't just mean you know, a big boat, Baal Shem Tev revealed that the word, the word Teva also means a word. And what that commandment is, Boyal HaTeva, it's telling each and every one of us to come into fully the words that we're saying, to, to, to show up our real selves and to open up. 
one of one of the one of the groups that uh, the training groups that I was in, um, they said you really want to open up. You now let it say any qualifiers. I feel a little this, or I was feeling slightly that. Boil hateva means I was nervous. Not I was a little nervous. I was ashamed. I was, you know, um, frightened. I I am sad. The qualifiers are those things that hold us back from really fully coming in. The other thing is to know another person while I'm listening, not to just be filled with what this means about me, but to forget for a few seconds about myself and to actually make room and space that another person, not just me, but another person can exist and I can want to know that other person, to listen in a deep way, what's underneath either the quiet or even the screaming or even the, the, the behaviors. There's something being said, usually it's fear or there's a sadness. So to listen in that type of way. And then when I get to know that person, not that they have to fit into my preconceived box of who they need to be, but to know and then to accept and to embrace and to hold that person. And the, the prerequisite to be able to be someone who is known and who can know another person, that requires a person to first and foremost have an intimacy with oneself, to have some sort of self-knowledge where a person first and foremost is aware, what is he or she thinking, feeling, and to also be honest and humble enough to know that there's also a jungle inside that is filled you know, with darkness and confusion and all sorts of different things. But if a person is really open and honest, a person you know, becomes you know, aware and you know, uh, confronts that, that part of him or herself. And, and then that can therefore allow a person to, to, to be honest and communicate appropriately, but honestly uh, with other people. A person can then have the confidence to also talk to other people because he's confronted his own shameful parts and has listened and accepted that first and foremost within himself. A good relationship with another person must always begin first and foremost with a relationship with oneself. And then you have the humility to also be able to identify with the jungle that's in another person because you, you're able to say, ah, okay, mine is just this color, shape, and size. That, that's, that's what real interest is. And there's different, many different exercises, whether a person you know, journals, whether a person goes to therapy and learns themselves, whether a person, you know, does, does his body this in a very, very open and honest and vulnerable way. These are all and many other ways of a person really being first and foremost honest and truthful and, and, and real with oneself that always has to come along with humility because if a person is honest, the person is always, you know, humbled by, by who they really are within themselves. And the, the final points I want to mention that there are a few you know, disclaimers when this is going on. Um, first and foremost, the person will maybe get to this in the questions, but not everything should or needs to be shared with one another. That's not what I'm talking about. Vulnerability doesn't mean that I'm an open book to, to, to this one person. No, there's appropriate things to share, appropriate things not to share, but that I can still go there in different areas of my life with, with the appropriate person. It's also not fair to, and realistic to put all of this on one person and only one person, whether it, even if it's a spouse, to assume that this one person can be that only place that can house all of this all of the time is not a fair expectation either. And therefore it's important for a person to have multiple relationships in their life, whether it's a, a person who's married should have still his uh, friends, whether it's his his friends from, from before that, or new friends, her friends, her family, her siblings, her parents, these are all relationships because a person cannot just rely on one. It's not, it's not fair to the other person. It's not realistic. Um, and that a person can't become also an intimacy or vulnerability, a vulnerable junkie. Life has to also have simplicity and it has to have some bagels and uh, you know, uh, donuts talk and recipes. Right. It has to it has to go there and come out, and it has to flow, um, you know, in and out of there. 
so you know, to, to summarize all of this, I think the best description really of, of this kind of intimacy that I'm talking about is, is what David Amalek says in, in Tehillim Membez, he says, Tahoim el Tahoim Kairi, that deep calls onto deep. All of the breakers and all of the waves have come upon me as well. For depth to call depth, it's to identify that you also have some way, shape, or form of things that have gone on. And therefore, you're able to allow and not come in that things have to fit a certain way. You can tolerate the messiness of another person, not to always put a lid on it or talk even about the Rabbi so quickly that you can avoid the intensity of what's going on because you, you're uncomfortable with it. No, it, because you first were, were, confronted it and allowed it to be from within yourself. And then you can also allow it from another person. That's tahayim el tahayim kairi. Deep can call to deep. Because kairi. So that's my opening few thoughts tonight, and uh, I turn the floor over. Thank you, Dr. Young. Beautiful, beautiful opening. It's getting my mind thinking already. Okay, Boishi, let's introduce you. Well, okay. Uh, again, anybody who's had questions, text, again, live questions will go first. We're going to hear from Moishi, and then we're going to open up. This is going to be a, a very big session tonight. It's a very powerful topic. Moishi Norman, LCSW, Certified Supervisor in Private Practice, and is Director of Quality Families in Lakewood, New Jersey. Moishi hosts the popular Mondays with Moishi show for mental health professionals and is a junction professor with the Wurzburger School of Social Work. Moishi Norman, open it up. All right, well, good evening. Thank you, Coach Menachem and Oshi and uh, Dr. Tapfer Binyamin, it's great to have you on. Thank you for those profound words. Uh, Binyamin, you stole my Dvar Tyra, so I'm gonna go straight into the, into the practical. Um, what I prepared tonight was um, more on verbal communication than nonverbal communication. Although, you know, if any questions come up on verbal or nonverbal communication, we're happy to take them. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be looking at verbal communication and because this is a podcast, so I created an acronym tonight called APOD. And this is going to cover four kinds or four components of communication which we're gonna talk about in a minute, but I just wanted to make a disclaimer or two. The first thing is that communication is so powerful that the nuances of communication when learned and uh, employed properly can really make or break a relationship. And especially when we're talking about relationships with difficult people, which I'm sure some of the questions are going to uh, be asked about difficult people engaging in relationships with complicated people, but, but even in engaging in relationships with not difficult people, with typical people, th there is a, a deepening of the relationship with which proper communication can really, really deepen and strengthen a relationship. And I hope to go through some of those things tonight. The other thing is that learning appropriate and proper communication skills does not necessarily take the place of psychotherapy because we can all learn how to communicate, but that doesn't always mean that we're able to. So uh, we're gonna talk about that in, in the first uh, acronym, the A of APOD, of APOD. The A stands for assertiveness. Assertiveness is a prerequisite to all communication. In order for us to really be able to communicate, we first need to be comfortable with communicating. And to be comfortable with communicating, we need to have some sense that we are entitled and we are deserving. And when we feel that we're entitled and deserving, we can then move in and communicate assertively. So that's the A of a pod, is assertiveness. And in order to feel uh, that we can communicate assertively, we need to distinguish the difference between assertive communication and aggressive communication. There are many people who are uncomfortable to be assertive because it feels to them that they're being aggressive. And aggressive communication is the kind of communication where oftentimes a person actually does not feel entitled. And in order for them to push themselves to feel entitled, they have to get aggressive and intimidating. And so somebody cuts you off on, you know, in the line in the supermarket and you say, hey, I was here first, get out of here. And we do something intimidating to assert our power, but that's not considered assertive communication, that's aggressive. For us to feel uh, that, we can, that we can incorporate assertive communication we must first feel that we're entitled 
So somebody walks in front of us online, a sort of communication would be to look at that person and say, oh, excuse me, I was standing here first, can you please move away? By doing so, we asserted our rights. We first felt that we had that entitlement and that right, and now we asserted ourselves and um, requested that the person please step aside. That's the assertive communication. Okay. The second, uh, the second in the acronym, we're, we're actually, I'll, I'll spell out the, uh, the A pod for you. The first is assertiveness, assertive communication. The second is the P, which is precise communication. The third, and this is perhaps gonna be the, the we'll put the biggest emphasis on this tonight, which is open communication. That's the O. And the D stands for direct communication. So again, A pod stands for assertive, which is a re prerequisite. That's why it's a separate word. And then precise communication, open communication, and direct communication. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's start with direct communication, okay? Direct communication is really important. People sometimes sort of uh, skirt the communication. They want to say something, but they only say it halfway. And we want people to be able to communicate directly. Okay. So here's, a, here's an example of indirect communication that I sometimes hear uh, from couples. The, the, let's just say wife will say to the husband, you know, you're really being mean to me or stop being mean. Now the problem with stop, well, now there's something assertive about saying stop being mean or you're being mean to me. That means that the person feels that they're entitled to stop some kind of aggressive or passive aggressive behavior. So they feel assertive. So step one is, is there. But when they say stop being mean to me or you're being really mean to me, they're not directly communicating what it is that they need or want from the person, okay? A, an example of direct communication in that same instance would be something like, if you're upset at me, please tell me specifically what it is instead of being mean to me. Okay, so here the person directly stated what it is that he or she is looking from, for from the other person. Please stop banging on the table would be direct communication versus the banging is really bothering me. Again, the banging is bothering me does bring out a point but it doesn't say, please stop banging on the table. And that little gap, which seems so insignificant, really creates the difference between boundaries in communication versus non-boundaries in communication. When I tell you, please stop doing that, I'm setting a boundary. It conveys very subtly that it's something that I'm not going to be able to tolerate or I won't tolerate. When I say the banging is bothering me, I'm kind of skirting that little boundary there. And I'm saying the banging is bothering me, right? We all know the rule. When the wife says to the husband, the garbage is full, what does the husband hear? Or she? He hears, the garbage is full. Okay? When the wife says, please take out the garbage, what does the husband hear? Please take out the garbage. Okay? So that subtlety in communication, being direct versus indirect, can make a great difference in the safety of the boundaries of the relationship. It means I'm not going to tolerate something um, that I'm not comfortable with, and the way I convey that. Again, the way I communicate that is I say, please stop doing that, or please do that differently, or please do that, versus it wouldn't it be so nice if that was done, where you're not directly communicating, and you leave a sort of out for the person to say no, or she didn't mean me, or it doesn't really bother her that much, because if it would, she would say it straight out. So that's direct communication. Open communication, and this is, this is one of my favorites, and uh, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine. Open communication is really discussing your feelings with the other person in the relationship. Okay, so this, this would apply actually more with friends and with spouses than it would say with children. You see, our children are not obligated to be worried and concerned for our feelings. They may, but it's not their responsibility to worry. What is my father feeling? What is my mother feeling? Um, am I making them feel good? Am I making them feel bad? That's not a child's responsibility. But in spousal relationships and friend relationships and adult relationships, um, uh, we are very much attuned to the way we are making each other feel because that, that's how they're gonna choose whether they wanna continue to be our friend or whether they're going to be, like Benjamin said, vulnerable um, and, and uh, forthcoming and honest uh, in the relationship. So, in, you know, and again, this is one of the things that I find uh, very couples you know, who are struggling really, really struggle with this, with being fully open and transparent with each other. And again, like Benjamin said, being open and transparent doesn't mean 
telling your spouse or the significant other, whether it's a relation or a parent or a friend, it doesn't necessarily mean telling them everything that you think or everything that you've done or everything that bothers you about them. But it does mean being fully open and transparent. And what I find is that there's a tremendous amount of shame. People are ashamed to face each other and be open. And sometimes I think of it like the Kruven. So the Kruven were either facing each other or they're facing away from each other. And I actually had a couple who I was working with uh, this past week. Um, and um, one of the things that we discovered was that, that you know, they each wanted a, some private time in the session. And one of the things we discovered was that the, they're both looking for the same thing and that's each other. He was looking for her and she was looking for him. But there was so much shame in his poor ability to function, in her poor ability to communicate well with him and tell her, him what she needs from him. Instead, she just started to snap or to withdraw or to yell. But in, rather than saying, look, this isn't working, can we sit down and figure out why it's not working? Can we sit down and figure out, uh, or I feel very hurt. So in open communication, it's, it's the, the process of facing each other. It's the crew of them saying, I want you and you want me and why is this not working? I'm feeling hurt because you don't help out enough. I'm, I'm busy with the children, with supper, and then with bedtime, and then with homework, and you're playing on your phone. Or we sit down to go out, you know, and, and sit down in a restaurant to talk to each other, and you're busy with your phone, or talking to your friends, or with work. And that's hurtful to me. And when, when we're able to really face ourselves, to become comfortable enough to report that and say that over to the other person, the other person can then apologize, which strengthens the relationship. They can explain themselves, which could poten potentially strengthen the relationship. They could problem solve with each other and come up collaborative with some kind of solution, which again, strengthens the relationship. But the ability to be vulnerable, to be honest, to be open with each other brings a tremendous relief and closeness in the relationship. One more thing I'd like to share on open communication. And that's something that I think is one of the most beautiful things um, that, I want, that I ever heard about a new couple who started off uh, their marriage and they were a couple months into the marriage and they noticed that uh, life six months into the marriage isn't as rosy as it is you know, uh, the day before the marriage. And you know, there are differences that come up and uh, my parents and your parents and the in-laws and where do we go and do we, do we buy this or that or the pink linen or the blue linen and differences come up and sometimes people get moody and things happen in relationships. One of the wisest things that I heard was a couple who sat down with each other. They were married for about six months. They sat down with each other and they said, look, I'd like to have, can we talk for, for a few minutes? It it's not the same as it was six months ago. And let's talk about what's going on. I, I wanna explain to you what goes on for me. So he said, uh, what goes on for me is that, you know, sometimes I have a bad day or I didn't get enough sleep the night before, or I'm anxious and nervous or worried about X, Y, and Z. And I want you to understand something. When that happens, and sometimes I snap or I yell or I, uh, you know, I get sharp or I'm I say something insensitive. I want you to understand this for now and forever. We marry each other, we care for each other, we love each other. And anytime that that happens, it's only because I'm losing some patience or I'm losing some steam. It doesn't have real meaning in the context of our relationship. The only thing it means is that I'm losing my grip on myself. So can we establish this for now and forever? And then she went back and said, said a very similar thing. And there became this mutual agreement in the relationship. And that held this couple together for many, 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 many years. Because whatever circumstances came up, the agreement was we both understand that there's something mutual here. And that is that we're in this together, that we may have days that we struggle with, with each other or with ourselves. And those are the causes to our behaviors. It's not because I don't respect you or I don't love you or I don't care about you. And that to me, you know, is the quintessential open communication. The last piece to the communication that we said, which is the A pod, was precision. And uh, this I'm going to spend very little time on, but precision of communication means that there are times that we, we express uh, uh, something, but we don't really say it precisely. So if you think about the difference between, um, uh, I have to get to this chasana on time because I must prepare and get myself ready versus the word, I'd love to get there on time so that I can prepare. 
or I'd like to get to that wedding on time so I can prepare. Sometimes when we change subtleties in the precision of the wording that we use, it makes a tremendous difference in the effect. When I say I, I must get to that wedding on time, so that creates a tremendous pressure and anxiety. As long as it's not happening and it's not working, I'm in conflict. It has to happen. What's going on? <laughs> and I start to hyperventilate. If I say, I'd like to get to the wedding on time, so it gives me a, a push, okay? It pushes me to, to make it happen and, and to uh, 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 ready myself, prepare myself and get the kids ready in the car. But I don't feel that same anxiety and pressure that, as if I have to get to the, to the wedding and to the chasana. So when we use precise language, we want to pay attention to the words that we use. If somebody's asking us how we're feeling and we say we feel good, that's very, very vague and not precise. If I say it's hurtful to me, it's frustrating to me, it's upsetting to me, it's exciting for me, then I give much stronger context and the person with whom I am communicating understands much stronger what it is they, that I am trying to convey. Okay, so that's my, my little opening here. And I'm sure that, that these themes will come round and round as we take some of the questions. Thank you, uh, and let's hit the road. Okay, thank you guys for coming. I'm gonna say this either A, P, or D. We have a tremendous amount of questions. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Um, again, we did, I didn't say this before the speeches, but I just wanna clarify. Communication, the reason why we started this year is um, when Moshe said he was going to come on and, and Dr. Yaman, communication, I feel, is the side of most Machoikasin between friends and 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 even a husband and wife and even with children. And anything we can do tonight to clarify some of those scenarios, I think will be tremendous helpful for everybody here tonight. And if this is negated to every single person. If you don't think it's negated to you, then it's for sure negated to you 100 percent So let's start off with the polls. And we have a lot of questions. Again, I'm gonna say even before we start, because I see the way you guys talk, you know, you guys, I'm gonna be very precise, very direct, long speeches. So we're gonna try to get to the questions. We'll try to knock it out tonight, okay? Let's start with the polls, hold on one second. Okay, everybody's an it's anonymous poll. Please let's answer, let's get a feeling from the crowd. In what area would you most benefit from better communication? Whether it be for your spouse, children slash family, neighbors slash friends, coworkers or bosses? Where do you feel that you would benefit most from better communication? It's a personal question. Second question, do you believe that good communication is the main variable in successful relationships? It's a yes, true or false answer. Okay, the third answer, third question, what percentage of success in a relationship depends on the degree of strength in the communication? Let me clarify that again. What percentage of number of success in a relationship depends on the degree of the strength of the communication? Zero to 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75%, or 76 to 100%. What percentage do you think would, is for the strength of the relationship? You have five seconds to answer and then we'll share with everybody. Okay, Moshi and Biyama, you could see it, but nobody else can see the answer, and then I'm going to share with everybody. Five, four, I'm being very direct there. So is this assertive or direct, Moshi? Which one am I being? You are being, well, you're certainly assertive, Moshi. Okay. <laughs> but yes, that's direct communication. You're telling people what to do. Exactly. Answer it, and you have five seconds. Answer it, you have five seconds, then the computer explodes. <clears throat> five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Okay, let's share it. So most people here tonight came for marriage physic and 55% feel the better communication, they would better, they would uh, benefit from their spouses. And to be honest with you, from the questions I have here in my, my, in my hand, 75% are between husband and wives. So uh, we definitely want to cover that. And children and family we have, we have neighbors and friends, and we have a little bit of coworkers and bosses. So it's good you answered in that order because that's the way the questions came in. Do you believe that a good communication is the main variable in a successful relationship? 91% of people say yes. 8% of people say false. What percentage of success in relationship depends on the degree of the strength of communication? The answer that 2% of people said is 0 to 25%, 26 to 50% is 8%, 51 to 75% is 35%, and 55% of the people here tonight feel 76 to 100% of the degree and the strength of the communication will have you have will help you have a successful relationship. You can exit the screen and Let's start, we have a bunch of questions again. Well, me... it's, it's no wonder why all these people join them because they're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. In order to maintain strong relationships, it's all about communication. Okay, thank you for communicating that. Let's start with um, some of the questions that came in. Again, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Anybody who wants to ask a question, if you go live, you get to go first, so you get to your question. If you want to text it, you're more than welcome to text it, but I'm letting you know there's a lot of material here. Okay, so let's start first, you ready? Um, this one, I'll, I'll start first with Dr. Biyaman, okay? And then Moshe, you can answer if you want to. Number one, 
my husband doesn't really express himself clearly. So I constantly have to guess and assume what he, what he likes, what he would like. And when things don't go his way, he gets so mad. How do I get him to talk? And then another question came and I put it together. I think it's a similar question. My husband is emotionally distant or just completely shut down. How do I get through to him? Dr. Miyama. Yeah. So the first thing, you can't get anyone to do anything. Uh, that, that's uh, rule number one. A uh, person has to decide uh, on their own to do something. You know, the, the only thing as a, as a, as a spouse, either in, this, in your questions, it's a wife. Um, but we can explore, you know, there, there's a couple of things. One thing is, is there, sometimes it has to do with that other person. That other person has some issue with communicating that they come into this relationship with. And um, no matter who I am, what I am, they're going to, they're, they're like that in every single relationship. The, the one question that I would start with is, is there any role that I, as the wife, don't even realize, but covertly play in the fact that he doesn't open up in this marriage? Meaning, because even when I listen, what Maishi and what Coach Menachem are talking about is listening is also, in a certain way, silently communicating back to the one who is speaking. And the one who is speaking is silently listening. Why? Because, you know... Is there always, um, uh, is the person always distracted? Is the person always rolling their eyes? Does the person always then criticize? Does the person, um, you know, um, always come back with some form of, uh, you know, what you said was unacceptable? So you, know, you might not even realize that he's perceiving what you do that way, or you might be doing that in a certain way. So that's something to look at. Are there other places where he's very comfortable talking, but suddenly with you? And if, you know, so, so that's, that's, you know, A, to have an honest look at, at is this about a relationship? B is, you know, I, I, I don't want to get in trouble. I, this is, in some of the cases, um, there's a covert, silent agreement when they already dated that she and he, in a certain way, agreed to this type of a relationship. And she also agreed to want this relationship and then catch about it her whole life. And, and um, so this is a very, you know, I, I, this is not in every case, but you know, that sometimes that itself is what she's comfortable with and she's repeating something that's, uh, that's uh, she doesn't even realize she's repeating because when it changes, she suddenly sabotages and even, isn't even ready for it. But there's something else much simpler, which is can also, she find the time to address this itself, you know, with um, one of one of Maishi's early uh, letters, is, you know, to have clear, to have direct, to have open communication about this, about the fact that, you know, how would it help for you to 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 open up and to communicate, you know, um, you know, are there ways that you need me or to listen or to hear or to answer you, um, you know, and if it's shut down and if it goes nowhere, which sometimes it does then, you know, this is not like, like, you know, quote, uh, you know, Moshe again, th 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 this a, 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 a very important place for sitting with a third party, which is a therapist, someone who is going to come and help facilitate um, things that are closed and people that, that aren't taking the really genuine and authentic invitation of someone else who is going to really listen, is going to really um, hear and respond. And sometimes the only way is um, is with someone else helping. And then that person sometimes needs their own individual work or sometimes with a the couples therapy, that helps very much. So those are a few of the ideas that come to my mind. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, ditto. I, Benjamin, that's exactly uh, what it is. And the only thing that I, I you know, uh, clarify to what you just said is um, there's two things that there's two ways that therapists can be helpful in marital therapy. One component is in facilitating the communication. So it's it's almost like an educational consultation. You know, if you speak this way, it helps them to be more receptive. It helps her to be more receptive. This helps this. You know, how do you feel more comfortable? And you kind of work out the kinks and the practice and the, just the practical kinks that go on and help uh, couples become more comfortable. But there's also a deeper thing that goes on in therapy, and that is. Uh, to start to learn to respect some of the sensitivities that other people have or understand what might be behind some of the reasons that I become defensive or aggressive or offensive. Uh, and when, when the spouse is able to have some more compassion 
and understanding towards some of these limitations, uh, a, a lot more respect can be developed and that can help uh, create more comfort in that relationship. So that's just two things that go on in the process of marital or couples counseling. Yeah, and I wanna jump in, you know, Maishi, on your clarification. And, you know, so um, one of the things you have to always just to be so careful with, you know, when, when you're dealing with relationship issues, um, to, you know, sometimes the first thing that a, a woman will do or a, spa or a husband will do, stuck in a difficult marriage, reflex will go to a therapist themselves. Um, and you have to be very, very careful to, to when you're dealing with relationship issues, to, to then work on it sometimes on, on your own as the, as the victim of, of, a, of, a, of a very um, painful relationship or, or an unfulfilling relationship. What then happens is the, the therapy takes on this agenda of let's, let's support you as an independent individual person, which sometimes, again, that's the right thing. There's a place for that. But, but you know, that's like you're taking a certain track. I think before that, you, you, we want to look at how do we strengthen this relationship first and foremost. We don't go to like, you know, supportive um, palliative, you know, care where, 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 where this person is already, you know, um, you know, never met the other person and is already, you know, hearing from this one party, you know, and then going, you know, uh, to third base already that this guy or this wife is this personality or that we want to, we want to begin where, where we at least bring both people to the table. And at the uh, initial uh, attempt is that, of course, we want to, we want to strengthen and fix a relationship. Um, well, so the that should be the, the, the relationship yeah. is the client. Correct. That should be, that should be our first step. Um, let's, when let's, things let's, like that happen. Questions here. Let's, let's jump on some live questions over here. You're on. Hi. Okay. My question about the centrality of communication. I agree with everything that's been said so far. I just want to make the point that most women complain that their husbands don't communicate enough. And really what they mean is I want a good listener. They don't even want really the man to talk that much, but I think men have to become very good listeners and that's great in communication. That's it that's needed. And the other thing is that while I agree that direct open communication is so important and I want to add to that, that often communications are not congruent, what I think and what I feel is not what I say. And I think that it's so important for our thoughts and our hearts to be one with what comes on our face. And often we hide and we're not really saying what we want. We don't even know what we want, but we call it communication. And it's really so difficult and we miss each other in that way. So I think an important ingredient is for us to know what we want, for our thought process and our hearts to be congruent with what's on our face and what comes out of us. And finally, where's respect? Where's love? Where's appreciation? Where's admiration? What, where are all those ingredients? And we're putting communication up front. I want to say that appreciation goes first and communication goes second, but whatever. Thank you very, very much. I'm learning a lot tonight. Moshe and Dr. Debra, I, I, I know I didn't tell you this before, and we have three therapists on tonight, and I appreciate what she said, and I feel it was to the point. Yeah. Want, let, let's go. Nahum. I can't hear you, Nahum. You're muted, man. You don't want to hear the feedback from the therapists? <laughs> okay, so no. uh, I'll put in the next question. My okay, husband so and I... Can I, can I just... Oh, yeah, let me just say something to Chaya. Um, I just want to say that, that um, Chaya, you're in good company. Dale Carnegie made this point almost 100 years ago, where, he's, where he said that he once sat at a dinner with a very, very prominent uh, businessman. I don't remember if he said the name and who it was, but he said that, that uh, the person pretty much babbled the entire dinner, and Dale Carnegie pretty much said, mm, oh, wow, that's wonderful. And uh, at the end of the conversation, Dale Carnegie writes that uh, the, the businessman said, you're one of the best conversationalists I ever, I ever met. Okay, he pretty much said nothing. So to, to your point, absolutely. And to your, to your third point about uh, respect and, and love and all those things, yeah, I think that that's what we, we addressed in the eight pod 
uh, when, when you're direct in communication, you're creating a certain safety. When you're open in communication, you're creating a very strong security in that relationship, which, uh, which are the enhancers to the love and respect and appreciation. I mean, th that's all there, absolutely. So yeah, spot on. Okay, very good. So here's my, the other husband, oh, the other wife. My husband and I really work on being connected and having proper communication. The problem I have is that he, is, he has so much going on in his life and I don't feel like he is, that he has the emotional space to be with me through my stuff. Can you tell me what a healthy way would be to communicate so that we can be more connected? So Moshe, I guess you can go first. You know, I think it's similar to the to the previous question at some level in which in which the starting point needs to be uh, communicating exactly this. Like if I were if I were this uh, person's consultant, I would say, I want you to take that exact statement that you just read, and I want you to put that to your husband and and say this exact thing. You know, there's so much that's going on in your life. Uh, you're so overwhelmed and busy, and there doesn't seem to be enough emotional space within you <clears throat> to be present for me. And and see where that goes, because that itself is communication. You want to jump in? You want to go to the next slide? One? Yeah, no, I, I think that that um, you know, there's a lot to, to say to that husband, you know, just hearing the description of him, because, you know, what, what, she, she should, you know, the first thing of being assertive, you know, was that you have to feel deserving. Every wife and every husband deserves that their spouse. Of course, there's times that we're busy and that we're not available, that, but that overall in a life, a person has to arrange their life in a such a way where their spouse feels that, that, that they are a priority and that there's space for them. And if there isn't, then they're not getting what a person in a marriage deserves and is entitled to have in a marriage. That Overall, and not the uh, barring weeks and uh, busy days and da 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 da, that that they feel that the other person has the the, the emotional uh, space for them, you know, and that they're not taken up by whatever they're doing, whether it's uh, the, you know the, the other people or the or, or their job. It has to be so, so. And then you have to feel first and foremost that you're entitled and deserve that. That's not too much to ask for. And then to directly communicate that, yeah. Okay, let's go. We have a bunch of live ones over here. Let's go. You're on. <clears throat> Hi. Am I on? Yes, we can't see you, but you're on. Okay, thank you. I, I for that. Is that okay? Yeah, sure, totally. Okay, okay. So um I have a question here. Um I am seeing a psychologist right now. Um, and I'm like seven months, I've been seeing her for seven months, and we basically it's a 12-month program. So um I'm learning some skills and I'm also at the same time doing like some trauma therapy with her and we're supposed to start start exposure for trauma therapy really soon like in the next two weeks or so anyways this right now what's going on is that she um she's not she's really too busy for me and she is not sending me this the skill like I'm just supposed to be available for skills coaching. It's a part of our contract, homework, and she just she's not really following up in this. And right now we have a, an appointment tomorrow to discuss what's going on because like I'm really I started becoming really commun in terms of our communication. I've become really resentful, and I'm not really you know using good communication style with her, uh, skills with her, and. Um, the truth is, I know she's too busy for me. She shouldn't have taken me on as a client. She has too many, she's head of a program. She runs another program. She does research. She teaches at the university. She, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She's always in the middle of the training. Sorry, I couldn't get, get to you when you, you know, paged me um, uh, with her excuses. But like the bottom line is I'm not getting, but I have this appointment with her tomorrow. And I, what I want to figure out is, like, you know, I'm resentful, but I want to be, I want to have some effective communication here. Um, and I'm just not sure even how to like even reinforce her in some positive way. Um, because I'm feeling that like at a time when I was in so much crisis, like last, 
like for recently, like she was totally really not available to me. Dr. Miyami, maybe you want to jump in on this one first. She needs some yeah, sure. communication with, with her therapist, psychologist. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like um, so, so first of all, a very important part of your therapy is your communication with your therapist. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm so happy you brought it up because therapy is not just going there and, um, and talking about your life. But what we talk a lot about is the relationship between you and your therapist, the transference, the counter-transference, all of that is such a big, big part of the therapy. So your talk tomorrow um, you know, is one that's very, very central to the work that you're doing with her. Um, and in terms of, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know the details behind and what she'll answer um, to you if she does, it doesn't have good reasons, but for you to be able to clearly express to your therapist what has gone on and um, why you feel the way you feel is something that uh, sounds very, very healthy. And what I would add is, uh, you know, that to not, you know, f force yourself to, to, to stay, you know, in an ongoing uh, therapy relationship um, over time, if, if this doesn't work out to, to the way that, you know, you felt it should, or it was clearly expressed to you that you should, that's also something, you know, it's healthy, especially in certain relationships that you don't, you know, continue something that, um, that uh, isn't meeting the, the standards and the expectations. That's also, that's healthy. You know, sometimes we, we, we stay in um, things that are not beneficial um, and, and that's, that's, it's a part of assertiveness in a, it, we communicate when we leave certain, you know, relationships, that's also communicating to, to the person and to ourselves. That we, we have no obligation to, to tolerate things that aren't meeting a standard that they should. Uh, of course, you first communicate that very clearly why it's upsetting you, but then uh, you have to perhaps make decisions. Yeah. But you want to jump on this one? You want to look at the next live one? Yeah, well, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I just, I'd like to just make a couple of comments about this. Um, first of all, Benjamin is absolutely right. The, the, the relationship that you have with a therapist is typically a microcosm of the relationship that you have with other people in your life. So uh, not, only do, not only is it reflective of what your relationship with others might look like, but your ability to enhance and improve your relationship with your therapist is going to enable you and strengthen your ability to have relationships with other people. If you can become assertive or you can become communicative and you take that risk and you take the plunge and you see that it's safe because the responding person is safe and is listening and is hearing, then you'll be able to do that with other, with other people in your life. So that is the therapy. That's a, that's a great part of the therapy. The other thing is that in, re, in relationships, there are sometimes things that are perceptual, which means that the way that I feel about it is not necessarily the way you feel towards me. So a little boy I was working with tonight, he's 13 years old, and he said to me, uh, um, there's a kid on my block who I'm trying to be friends with, and he keeps ignoring me, and he doesn't want to be my friend, right? Now, in his mind, uh, the, the other boy doesn't want to be his friend, and his, in the other boy's mind, he just may be very busy with other things and hasn't picked up or, or hasn't picked up on the social cues that he's trying to make friends with him. So, so there are a lot of perceptual things that we imagine are going on in relationships, and when we bring them to the table, uh, we could dissolve them. Okay. And the last thing is that we, you know, sometimes we feel like we're in certain kinds of relationships. We don't really enter certain kinds of relationships. We create our relationships. Okay. So uh, um, by being open and allowing the other person to be open, we create an open, safe relationship. If we, if we feel intimidated or uncomfortable in a relationship, then we create an uncomfortable relationship. So by you being able to go to the therapist, sit down and say, look, this is how it feels to me. It feels like you've been avoiding me, right? And the therapist being able to say, oh, I didn't realize, you know, or being able to, whichever way, it's a win-win, it's a win-win situation. And the last thing you might want to do is say, is there something that I'm doing to contribute to this in the relationship uh, that you're avoiding me? Am I pushing boundaries? Am I calling you too often? Am I um, insisting too much? What might I be doing? Or is there something? So even if there is nothing, but it puts you on the, uh, instead of you being sort of positioned in a defensive way where the therapist now has to be careful around you, the therapist can be very, very open and comfortable because you've said, am I doing something wrong? Okay, you guys, I'm gonna put on somebody I think you both know. Let's go, you're on. 
All right. Um, thank you, both of you. I have a ton of respect for, for what, what both of you have done, Moishi specifically in the Lakewood community. Your work uh, speaks to volumes, uh, and I appreciate that. Um, really quick question. This is a little bit more of a theoretical question, but um, there's been a lot of talk about the rising rate of divorce, specifically amongst young couples. Do either of you think that that rising rate of divorce is correlated to poor communication? Um, and if yes, why do young people struggle with communication? Do you want to go first on that one? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a tough question. Uh, I I don't know of any you know research or studies that are done on this, but um, I, again, like like I said in the introduction, I believe that that the communication is what makes and breaks the relationships. It strengthens the relationships. I I think that communication is a large part of what's going on. I think there are also many other contributors. Um, maybe Dr. Tuffer has more information on this. Um, but I think that what we really want to look at is why are people struggling with communication today? Yes, it may be the communication, but why are people not communicating like they used to? And it may be because of technology, it may be for other reasons, but why is the communication uh, level not the same as it was? Are people not forced to communicate? Uh, are they not forced to face each other? Are there too many easy outs? You know, so it's a good question. Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, to, to put it all on communication, um, I, I think we'd miss a lot of this. You know, I think that between the lines of, of, of every what we've been talking about communication, it requires work, ongoing work uh, for, for uh, every couple, for any relationship. The ongoing work is we, we always want to go back to a default of either not being so open or taking things very personally or, or communicating you know we, we go back to certain old defaults <clears throat> by nature we have to really really pay attention and you know regulate ourselves you know and and I, I don't you know I think that there's a lot of great things going on um you know now for example this type of talk you know, to be able for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of people to, to hear about, on a Sunday night about communication, that's unparalleled. I don't know, 25 or 50 years ago, I don't think couples were doing this. So there's so much out there. And I think relationships in a certain way are deepening. I think there's, there's probably, you know, more time being spent certain vulnerabilities. Um, there's more professional help. So there's a lot of wonderful things going on. I think on, on the other side, you know, when I, you know, there's, there's, there's people who aren't willing to do the work, you know, because there's also things that are coming very easily, you know, easy these days. And there's a certain, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, laziness or, or if, if things aren't delivered to me right here, right now, um, and, and, and relationships and communication and things like that. These are things that are, you know, you, know, you got to sign up for the 85 year plan. Of, of a lifetime or 120 year plan of a lifetime of, of real, real work. And sometimes people, you know, had this delusion that their relationship was going to be something that they saw, you know, on, on like a Netflix, uh, whatever, uh, you know, series. And, and, and it's very much not that. So, um, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, and, and it's becoming more acceptable uh, technology. There's, there's many reasons, um, you know, why, but I think that, um, you know, there's also, I, I think we shouldn't just be, be pessimistic. I think there's also a tremendous amount of, of, of great things coming out in terms of, of, of how people are relating to one another uh, as well. I think both of them are, 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 are true. Thank you. Hi, should I ask my question now? Your turn, you got it. Oh, great. Um, so we're all here now listening to, we're trying to improve our communication skills, but the people in our lives that we're trying to communicate are not here. So my question is like this, if I learn communication skills and I know how to communicate and I'm trying to communicate with someone that's shut down or not willing to open up, does it help if I keep learning skills or should I just give up on the relationship with the person? In short, that's my question. Do oh, you wanna go first on that one? I'll pass that one over to Benjamin first. I need to think about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, well, you know, 
it's a, it's a broad question. So uh, the first thing that comes to me is, you know, very much depends. See, there are certain, there are certain people, we were alluding to this earlier, there are certain things that have to do with the dynamic in a relationship, meaning that if, if you're a certain type of person, you can disarm people, allow people to be vulnerable. Certain people have that kaya, have, you know, they're very, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of people and, and people open up to them, you know? And so for you to become that type of person, of course, that will help tremendously that people in your presence will not be intimidated, but actually will just, you know, you're vulnerable to them, you're open, um, you're not, uh, you know, giving this ear of like, you know, perfectionism around them. And you know, you're very disarming and therefore you're going to bring out that from, from other people. But um, there, there are then certain situations where that individual um, who you're referring to, who you're talking to, that's why I'm saying it depends, can, can sometimes have individual things that no matter who they are with, they will remain closed until they themselves do their own hard, you know, personal work or make their personal decision that they want to do. And, and they'll be closed in front of in front of anyone, you know. So so that's why it very much depends. So you can of course, you know, uh, help, but will it always um, be effective? I think it really depends on which situation you're talking about. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a very broad and tough, difficult. Question. Can I make it more specific? Sure. Let's go. Let's get into it. Okay. Um, so this person in mind right now that I'll just make it more specific because I have more than one person in my mind now, but is a friend of mine who I know in general is more closed, not with me, just in general. So I was discussing it with someone because in the beginning I got hurt from the relationship. I kept opening up, making myself vulnerable, wanted to have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I felt that this person also did, but I I wasn't getting, it was just like kind of one way every time I opened up was, oh, that's so hard. Not, you know, like not a two way street. So first I thought that it was something personal. And then I noticed that it's really not a personal thing. It's she's like that to everyone. So I tried opening up to her and she actually told me things that she didn't tell anyone else. Like she was diagnosed and different things like that, that I knew she valued me as a friend. Um, and recently, I, we didn't speak a couple in a couple months and another friend told me, why don't you send her a message? Our relationship means a lot to me. Um, I would just wanna know where we're standing. I'm just wondering why I'm being ignored. So that's what I did. And she called me up and she pretended like nothing happened. This was a few months that we didn't speak. And I was very just weirded out by it because I'm a person that likes to have open communication and just talk, not pretend that nothing's going on here. Let's just talk this out. So I said to her, like, you know, what, what's going on? We haven't spoken for so long. So she said, oh, I've just been very busy. And I was just confused, like, oh, do you have other friends that you're talking to? Because she made it sound like she was diagnosed with a severe illness and she hasn't, she lost a lot of her friends. So I was trying to ask her, do you keep in touch with this person, that person? No, no, no. And it showed me that, like, it's not because, it's not a personal, it's nothing personal, but it's something on her part. So when I was talking to someone, because I want to protect myself, I want to be there for other people, but I have to do what's good for me first. So this person told me that I have to decide if I want to be there because I have to know that she's, I'm not going to change her. So this is just something that popped in my head now, but there's many people in my life that I try to be open with because I like to have open communication and they're kind of like a closed board until you know, because I try to be warm and nice and there, sometimes I get hurt because I try to be open and they're just closed. So that's a more personal question, um, more specific. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, it's, it's important to be mindful of all those variables that you just mentioned. You want to be mindful, number one, that she doesn't sound like she feels very safe in relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay, she she does seem to be able to contain. In other words, she can hear your troubles. She can hear you and be there and be present for you. But to allow herself to be vulnerable uh, may be too difficult for her. It may it may be too triggering for her. It may be too unsafe for her. Uh, you know, we don't know exactly what the details are. But when we discuss this kind of communication, what I'd like to think is we want to go to the deeper level of the communication, which is you've been saying to her, you've been communicating to her 
what's with our relationship, um, you haven't been speaking to me, that's more on a super, superficial level. You'd like to get a little deeper into the communication and say, look, you know, I find myself becoming vulnerable to you and then I feel that you are withdrawing and sort of not coming all the way into the relationship with me. Have you noticed that that's what's going on? So rather than staying on the superficial level, go a little bit deeper into the relationship and ask what that's like for her. And that you'll, you'll see from there whether that will draw her out more or whether she'll freeze up more. And, and if she'll freeze up more then like Dr. Tepfer said, uh, she's probably not in a position that, she's, that she has the ability to be open enough to be in a relationship. If that draws her out more, then, then you've deepened the relationship with her through that communication. Let's go to another question over here, okay? Well, she, I want to jump right, in. Sorry, can I ask? Can yeah. I, can I, can I? Yeah, yeah, Coach Matthew, you go. No, I just want to jump in there because I think this is a very um, important piece over here. Um, just in general, question number one, is a relationship, should a relationship be the same both ways? It means I open up, now I want you to open up. Now I'm opening up, now I want you to open up. I'm waiting, it's not happening. So that's number one, because I think um, in, in marriage spouses this you know you have women men which could be everybody's different but let's say in general women are more open and men are closed it doesn't have to be that way but you know in general so she is there and working on a relationship and he is not and she is and he is not and i'm waiting it's not happening so i'm just thinking in general is that how it works the relationship or maybe like we've heard you know I'm here, I'm happy that somebody's listening to me. I don't need, I don't know how to express it, but if I need them, then I'm not getting it. And then I get, uh, you know, we get uh, disappointed. Who, who, are you, who are you choosing to answer? You have, you have something you, have you want to, to be direct who you want. You, want, you have to be direct who you want to answer the question. Okay, I think uh, whoever has something to say. <laughs> You could start. Yeah. Okay. So, so relationships are really fascinating because people have different needs in the relationships. And like Dr. Tepfer alluded to earlier, um, there's something unconscious that's already going on from the first moments that we meet another person. So when you dated your wife, you know, for those of you who, who dated, but uh, when you dated your wife on the first date, you already, the first few minutes of the first date, you already picked up a tremendous amount of information. If she was chatty and you were subdued, or you were chatty and she was subdued, uh, and that's part of the reason that you married each other, uh, then, then that's gonna be there forever. That dynamic was already created in the first moments. Of, like I said, you, you make the relationship, you create the relationship. And if one person has needs in the relationship that the other person is not filling, then there's a gap, right? Y your question was, should relationships go both ways? And there isn't really a should, because it depends on the needs of the people. So if you and I are in a relationship, Menachem, and um, uh, you're very quiet and I'm very chatty, and I wanna hear more information from you because I, I feel like all you're doing is Dale carnegie me, right? But I want some feedback from you. I wanna know if you approve what I say. I wanna know if you disapprove. I like to get into heated debates and arguments. It's not working for me. Then I'm gonna I'm going to have to draw that out of you because it's not in you. And, and if I can't draw it out of you, then I'm going to have to come to some level of acceptance or I'm going to have to keep trying to draw that out of you or I'll just be in a frustrated relationship. So there, I wouldn't say that there is a should. It's really what are the needs of the people and can they work to cultivate, to cultivate that relationship? Mm -hmm. Let's go to another live question now, okay? Do you want to say something? you want to add something on this? He wanted to add, yeah. I want to jump in. I want to jump in for one second because it, it, Sarah is uh, okay if I add one point. It's really what what, what Menachem was a little bit also. You know, I don't know. I don't know. You, you know, you said this is happening also a few different times. And and the question is, are you finding yourself for some reason in these type of dynamics where you find yourself gravitating and finding people that you end up sharing with, and they end up not sharing back. You know, it seems like the, 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 you said there's more than one person. So then from your end, there's an interesting question. Why is that happening? Why are you ending up in an interesting dynamic where you share and the other people don't share back? 
you know, are you, are you, are you not realizing that somehow these are the, you know, you, there could be many reasons why that happens, but just to think about that question for yourself might be a helpful question for you to explore in your own mind as you, you know, move forward the rest of your life and have relationships to answer that question. Because if you don't, you may find this repeated dynamic where you're going to be with people and you share and they don't share back. And um, because somehow that, that's something you're ending up in. It's a dynamic that, that you don't like, you're not conscious of, but that you're finding yourself in. And, and to, to, to open that up. I don't know if that uh, resonates with you or not. Um, yeah, I, when I said a few people, but it's a good thing to think about for myself, I meant a few people that I have good communication skills, I think. I always want to learn more, but, and they are closed mm-hmm. or not yeah. even like a friendship or mm-hmm. family member or whatever, just trying to communicate. So my question mm-hmm. was, I think everyone has this question, whoever's on this thing mm-hmm. of okay. we're learning and we want to know if it's going to help mm-hmm. if they don't communicate well, but thank you. I appreciate it. Let's go to the next live question. You're on. Um, hello. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hi. So my question that I'm asking is more on communication with dating. Um, the specific question that I has, have is if there is a couple that is dating properly, they have the right guidance and they're going through all the right tools and speaking to the right people and they go out for a very long time and in middle something happens and they end up breaking up due to a certain comment that let's say one party makes. And till then, everything really went smooth. However, something in the communication at one point didn't go well. And at that point, because everyone's frustrated, they decide to end the relationship. Later on, one of the parties want to revisit it. And the other party feels that they already went through it and they feel like they did their communication. What would be your advice as if let's, if somebody would want to go back to something and, you know, they feel they went through the dating properly. However, the other party feels that they didn't possibly express themselves as well. I think you should jump on that one first. Yeah. Okay. Um, so listen, I, I, I tried to follow exactly what you're saying. So I hope I, I got it clear. It's that um, one of the parties wants to revisit something. It's the party that said said the thing wrong. It's the party that was hurt. Uh, which one wants to is the one who wants to re-explore it? Okay, I, I don't know she's if you're muted. still there. Okay, she's muted. You want she's to there. Okay, she's there. hi, I'm back. Yeah, okay. Man. The one who said something wants to revisit it because they felt that they didn't explain themselves Got properly. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Not, not so proper. Got it. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> first of all, the, the other party has every right to say that they heard something or whatever this thing is, and they were you know, saw that as something very concerning or very hurtful, and they are not interested in revisiting it or commu- or hearing the communication. It's not like these people are married for 15 years and, we, and they have to have a conversation about something that was said, you know, this is a, a dating. There is no obligation, again, in, in my mind, that the, that the person who, 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 who was hurt has to now go ahead and, and, and it could be something that they felt is enough for them to, to you know, to yellow, you know, everyone's hopefully on their best behavior in dating. If there's something that's so hurtful at that point already, that to them is significant enough that they don't want. So they have every right there and to say that. Now, it's their but party has every right to request, hey, to explain something. So if they get a yes, then it's a beautiful um, opportunity for one to explain themselves better what they really meant because like my she was talking about before with the, with the little boy, so much, so much of communication can very much be perception. You don't know. But 
I would be very weary because I, I don't know the exact thing that was, was going on here. But you don't want a situation, if you're the, the victim of this situation, right, to, to be sweet-talked and manipulated back into something that you're not then trusting or gut that you had, but something that was said, and then it's somehow whitewashed or sugar-coated right now. And, you know, and I, I really meant this because I, there, there are abusive relationships where you can you can be in the in the room and he you know he has uh, a, she has a list of 15 what and said you know and said, you know, a physical therapist. I mean, anyone could be a physical therapist. Physical therapists are for like stupid, you know, um, dumb people. And she got insulted by because she's, you know, going to school. I, I, to, he didn't mean her. And, and she said, my whole life, he's been telling me, I meant this, I didn't mean that, I meant that, I didn't mean that. You know, and, 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 and of course he meant that, you know. But I would trust, you know, so there has to be a very, very clear enough explanation. You know, so I'm saying not to, not to not trust yourself if you were hurt by something. But if you were open to hearing something, you know, it depends how egregious the thing was. And okay, I hope that answers a little bit. Is it okay if I jump to the next question to you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, let's 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 get a little bit into different type of communication. Moshe, you answer this first if you don't mind. How can I validate someone's feelings when I think they are completely wrong? I'm just gonna use this example because we've got a few different types. We'll use this one, it can be any example. My wife thinks we should invite my in-laws for entire Yom Tif. Every year we have done this, it ended in disaster. But she's fighting to invite them now for a full two weeks in the summer. Like, like you know it's going to be a disaster. I have to validate. I understand her feelings. She's completely wrong. How do I do that? Okay. So what, what, let's, one of the, let's go back one step because I know yeah. you do Monday nights with Moishi with therapists. But for us people that don't know how to validate, don't even know what the word means, maybe explain it first and then explain how to do it. Okay. Excellent. So let's, let's talk about validation. Validation happens to be an extremely valuable and, and critical part of communication. Okay, and I'm going to say what validation is not and what validation is. I'm going to try to be as concise and clear as possible. Validation is not, you have every right to beat somebody up. Validation does not validate negative, bad behaviors. What validation does is it permits a person to feel, it's like a verbal permission to feel what a person is feeling. That must be so hard for you is not as validating as that's really tough. Because when I say that must be, I say to my kids, you must clean up the room. It's a command word. But if I say that's really tough, that's really hurtful. That's really upsetting. What I'm doing is I'm crawling into the other person's perception. I'm imagining it. And I am saying, I can see how that's upsetting and hurtful. So uh, I want my in-laws, I want my parents to come over for two weeks in the summer. And in the past, that's been a disaster. What I'm not looking to do in validation is to say, um, uh, yeah, let's have your parents over because it's going to work out. Since you think it's going to work out, I have to say that I validate that it's going to work out and let's just do it. What validation means is I understand why you feel so needy and so excited and you want your parents to come over in the summer because it's so lovely for you when your parents are over and you get to reminisce and have these nostalgic moments and get together with your family. And that's so, that's so fun for you. I can see why that's really a lot of fun. That's what validation is. It's, it's acknowledging and appreciating the experience, the emotional experience that the other person has and putting words to acknowledge that. So when I acknowledge that, uh, that I understand why, the deeper I get into my understanding of why that's so delicious for them and why that's so fun for them, the closer they're gonna to feel to me. That's completely irrespective to whether they're gonna come over or not. Does that help, Ashi? You're muted. Yes, that was great. Um, do you, know, you want to jump on validation a little bit? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I agree. And I think that therefore the second question is, should they not then come and be a, hopefully a mutual decision? They both have to then consider each other and the impact that it has upon each other and hopefully reach either compromise or if it's something that one cares so much about and the other one really doesn't care so much about, then it can be something that, uh, you know, the other person, of course, uh, you know, allows the other person. But, but yeah, you can, that's what, like, I think that just to reemphasize, 
you can validate, but then it has nothing to do with then the actual decision uh, you know, to then agree that that's the way it's done um, and, and, and lose your own voice and don't exist is not uh, uh, yeah. what that means. And I want, I want to add something to validation that, that people don't really know. You know, what, what's really cool is that when, when somebody has an exciting experience, you know that 99% of the excitement in the experience is the fantasy and, and the hype that goes into it. When, when we get a new car, you know, in a beautiful car. So it's like exciting for the first day or two, and then you kind of get used to it and you forget about it. And that same car, when you look at it in the street 25 years later, it looks like a schmata, right? So what, what's so exciting? What's exciting is that fantasy, that imagination that builds up within you. And when we validate somebody, the deeper we get into their experience, the more we actually relax that need. Okay, so if we were to talk about how exciting it would be when their parents are here and what they might go through and what games they would play and what they're going to remember, right. it actually provides the person with the experience itself, thereby reducing the need for that experience. So that's part of the power of validation. What happens if the validation ends up with a but right afterwards? Then, you know, you probably excluded the validation. Well, yeah. that's isn't that an important point? Like... Yeah, yeah I, I know exactly what you want to do now. You're going to validate my feelings and you're going to tell me what you want. And, and, and personally, I've, I've heard from many people um, when they were young and uh, having difficulties in class when their Rebbe wanted to help them out. And um, they can bring up something small, finally they opened up a little bit and the Rebbe says, okay, don't worry, I'll take care of it. No, it's nothing, this not realizing by saying these few words, it just closed them back up again. And never again am I gonna share my feelings to anyone. <laughs> yeah. So this is very tricky. The validation parts should not end up with anything afterwards. But let me think about it. I'll get back to you tomorrow. It's not a means to an end. It's an end in itself. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Here's a question of, uh, we, got, we need a raise over here. I'm one of the main people in my company. I have been here for 10 plus years and my salary has gone up only minimally. Every time I want to ask for a raise, I'm scared. I feel unappreciated and overlooked. I feel like quitting. I don't know how to ask for a raise. Yeah. yeah. Right. So this is uh, this one, no, of a, a one of your employees wrote this to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, this is exactly the case of, I feel underappreciated, I feel overlooked. Um, and, and, and it has so much to do with the fact that there's their own personal fear of, of, um, of asserting themselves. And um, you know, asserting oneself just really means a simple, honest understanding, not over valuing oneself, not undervaluing oneself. And to, and to realize that a person, you know, sometimes plays an essential role, an important role in a company. And, you know, you, you, and, and a person has to and should and needs to be compensated. Um, you know, if a person has to, if sometimes it helps a person to realize, hey, it's a favor for me to ask this person. Instead of me being resentful, not doing a good job, and then ultimately maybe leaving, my boss wants to hear, hopefully for me, that, you know, what I need, you know, not, not that he's going to have, but ultimately, like any relationship, it's a favor about what I need the other person because I'm going to communicate what I need. I say you're always communicating what you need one way or the other. Either you communicate it by coming in every day, being resentful and doing a you know 75 percent job and then quitting. That's so you communicated you needed a raise, or you can communicate they need a raise very, very close, you know, directly. In. So just understand. That you, for that person to look into, I'm sure there's a history where he and that does articulate what he needs just with a raise. Because for the boss, then it's coming up in 50 places, 50 other uh, times and, and relationships um, for him to actually express something that he needs um, and, and that he's entitled to, perhaps, in that situation. So to look closely, probably. When, you know, he, usually it's, it, it goes back to these are things that helped him when he was very, very young to not speak up. Because if he would have spoken to that when he was seven years old or nine years old or 11 years old, then it would have been. So 
to survive as a child, it was very helpful to be invisible or to not have needs. Whatever that 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 was good then. And then so he has to realize, but you know, at, at 47 or at 37, that same with his father or his volatile mother, whoever it was, ultimately going to be useful in the adult world. And he has to understand, of course, even somatically, he's going to freeze up. It's going to be hard. But that this is the work that a person like that has to has to realize. It's not the um, ultimately that's what's good for him, what's good for other people, um, and to and to to be able to to clearly realize that that it's not going to be comfortable. But that he's living often in a in a distorted world, um, you know, too much in the minds of other people rather than being able to live from within himself. I want, to, I want to jump with another question. I know you want to respond, but I want to jump with another because there's so much yeah. to talk here. This well, I, have a, I have a good response. I, if that person's online, he's going to want to hear my response. Okay, sure. All right, well, I'm going to do a real, I'll do it real quick. Uh, there's two things in communicating that you want to raise. Okay, there's two different uh, um, approaches. You can do conventional and you can sit down and discuss the advantages and what you bring to the company and you know how, how you're an asset to the company and why you think you deserve more. And that's probably the, the conventional advice that you'd get. But I, I'd, re, I'd rather focus on the opposite. Um, I trained a lot in what's called paradoxical interventions. And um, I would rather say that what people like most is to feel validated, period. When people talk, they talk because they want to be heard. Everybody wants to be heard and wants to be validated. And so what I would do if I was going in for a raise to my boss is I would first make a list of all the reasons that he should not give me a raise. And I'd present those reasons to him. I'd say, look, you know, I work really hard here, but I understand that it would be difficult for you to give me a raise uh, because the, you know, the company is having financial straits. And, and, and I'd give him a bunch of reasons. And by doing so, what I'm essentially doing is I'm causing him to feel very, very understood and validated. And again, like I said, once that happens, a person feels a whole lot calmer. And then they, it frees up their mind to open up to, well, it's not really true. You do a really good job at this. You know, We've had other people in this position. You do a phenomenal job. And I think you really do deserve something. And then we could start negotiating the raise. But that's how I would communicate that. So if you're on, whoever asked that question, uh, I'd love to have some feedback after you have that conversation with the boss. And, and if it doesn't work out, Oshie and Menachem will compensate you. That's right. OK, Moshe, this is for you. My eight-year-old, we didn't touch children. My eight-year-old son flips out anytime I tell him no when I'm asking him, when, I, when he asks for something. I know it's important for a child to not always get his way, and I feel guilty giving in just because of his tantrum. Is there any way I can effectively communicate to him yeah. in a way that gives over our values? Great question. So uh, what I'd like to say is like this. Another piece in communication, um, I haven't coined the term for it yet, but you kind of want to sometimes uh, cushion the blow. And there are some children who, for whatever reason, in many cases, this is the way they're, they're wired. Uh, in other cases, it's because of whatever defenses they develop. But in many cases, there are children who cannot handle the word no. When I say they can't handle the word no, it could be that the word itself is a trigger, or it could be that the concept of depriving them of what they're demanding is too difficult for them to handle for whatever, whatever reasons. And so therefore, what I'd like to suggest is that rather than using the word and oh, no, we want to either uh, come up with another way to not give them that without saying no, or to actually say yes. And when I say yes, that doesn't mean you're going to give it to them. Take this example. So you have a child who um, ate, you know, two bites of his chicken for dinner, uh, and now he's demanding that he wants his dessert. Okay, so mom says, you can't have dessert. You didn't finish supper. You have to eat healthy food, son. Don't you know that? You're not going to be healthy. You're going to turn into an ice cream cone, right? So uh, um, the child has a tantrum. You, how can you say no, right? That, that's one kind of communication. A more effective communication might be to say to the child, sure, of course you can have dessert. Have a few more bites of the chicken or finish up, you know, finish up your, your drumstick, your polka, and then, you can, and then you can have the dessert. When the child hears the word yes or sure, he receives it completely differently. And now he's able to function uh, and to contemplate whether that's an option or not. He still may be resistant, but it's not going to have that same reaction. Uh, another way to do it is uh, when, when you can't give in, like a case where you have where you can't actually say yes under any circumstances, would be to say, oh, I know, I wish I could give it to you. I wish we could have that right now. Wouldn't it be great? And you go into the validating stage where um, you kind of fantasize with the child what it would be like and how you wish so much that that would be possible. This happens all the time. Kids come home from school. They said, Ma, you said after, after I come home from school, you're going to take me to the toy store. Well, I'm home from school. 
And Ma says, yeah, but the challah's in the oven. And, uh, you know, if, we, if I leave the challah in the oven and go to the store, the challah will burn and the kid has a tantrum, right? So mom can say, oh, I wish we could go to the store now. If only that challah wasn't in the oven and we could go to the store. So she's kind of going into his world that she wishes with him that they can do it and implying without being direct. Okay, here we want to pull away from the directness and the communication because the directness is too much of a trigger. So without being direct, pull back and say, I wish we could do that. Oh, I wish that challah wasn't in the oven and I would have thought of that before. And that could sometimes mitigate the explosion. Okay, Dr. Yaman, I know you want to answer, but I have so many things. Let's let's move on. Go, you're on. This is one of the co-founders of the show. Go. Hi. Um, I was wondering, it, it seems that in order to really um, communicate, I guess, you have to have a sense of self to really know yourself in order to really communicate your needs. What, has this ever happened? Or I don't know how you would resolve it, a situation where uh, I've seen couples that grow apart, you know, maybe they dated, they, they married too young, or they, or the situation where you started a job when you were young and inexperienced, and then you grow, and then, you know, you, you want to express yourself, and you realize that you, you may, you may have no longer have the shared values or goals as either the, the either a spouse, a company, I mean, is there any way that could be rectified? Are, are you able to do that with you know, couples that, you know, people that just, I don't know, they're, you know, we, we all change and grow, uh, hopefully grow, you know, in our, in our, you know, over the years. I mean, is there, I mean, I don't know if you've ever encountered that situation or, or, or how, what we do to like. I, I want I want to, I want to, I, I hear what she's saying and I want to read a question. Somebody texted me and they said, I'd be scared to ask it, but I'm going to ask it, but don't, don't answer the rabbi part because you guys are not rabbis. Can I read the question? Yama, yeah, you ready? Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think I'm quite self-aware and pretty good at sharing and being vulnerable when I feel it's safe to do so. But I feel I cannot be authentic in most of my relationships because something integral that I feel I cannot share. My secret after many years of questioning and searching, I no longer believe in Tyra and other orthodox things. I still look super from. I have no bad feeling towards good from people who I interact with. Yet I know my secret is not one that is safe to share with the community. I know that that would lead to rejection or, or a suspicion. The lack of authenticity is very diff difficult for me. Any thoughts? She can't have any relationships with people because who she is, she's not herself happy with what she is. So I'm just, I, I think that's what Kaya is getting to. Uh, let's start with Dr. Yeah, Bjorn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the, 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 um, well, she's right. If you have a very, very deep um, and fundamental secret within you, your communication to people um, is always going to be very, very, very much compromised. Um, because, and, and you feel like these people are people that you're not going to, for whatever reason, she, her, her, she doesn't feel comfortable or safe to, to share about the religion. She's right. She will never feel because it's such an essential part of the secret. When you hold a secret and you try to be, um, you know, connected to other people, sh she won't. She won't have that. So th there's different things she can do. Um, you know, the first thing that came to my mind is to have you know, conversations with the right type of people whom she can be honest with. There are safe people. There's special rabbanim and, and rebbitzins and teachers that that have dealt and with plenty of, of situations like this where it is safe. And um, those are the places where, you know, she, or certain individuals where she, 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 you know, she will feel connected. But, but she, I, I have nothing to say other than she, there is no um, magic to, to um, you know, a magic pill to, to say that somehow she's going to be fully understood and known and connected to people where, where she's hiding from them. So that, that there will always be that sense um, of distance between herself when she holds the secret to other people. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that there are people that she probably can find that are safe. That's what, that's what I would sort of uh, throw out there and, and have real honest conversations um, with them uh, and hopefully feel uh, understood and hopefully even you know, inspired and clarified you know, with some of these issues. Um, uh, yeah, and then you were t touching on maybe I, you got a little cut off. 
But you were touching on something else, which I think is a whole fascinating other topic, which is people change over life. I think you were referring to that. So even not even the dramatic thing. And, and I think that anyone who's in a long-term relationship, so there's this, you know, you get married, but then you have to stay married. And I think you're like getting the new versions of each of you. Not that we change so, so, so dramatic. It's very small and incremental, but we're not the same people, hopefully, that we were, you know, uh, 10, 20, 40, 30, 40 years ago. And I think that the marriage repositions itself. And if you have two mature people who they grow in a certain way together, but they also grow individually and the relationship has to, um, if it has the, 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 the strength, it, it repositions itself. It has, it's, it's, it's mature enough to absorb change and to accept change. And I think that that's a beautiful way of, of, of saying that that's a healthy part of, of a relationship. People aren't supposed to be static over the course of their lives in, in different ways. You know, the interests change in, in hopefully they're growing in different ways. The sensitivities, their outlooks change. I don't know, people don't stay the same. And, 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 and I think that, you know, sometimes, you know, they would say systems resist change. And in a certain way there is a resistance, but, but to, to be aware of that, like, hey, it's, it's healthy that our spouse is sometimes resistant to it because, you know, it keeps us in a certain way sometimes in check that, that the change isn't sometimes too radical. And then it happens in slow increments because of that. Um, you know, I, but, but I think it's something to just be, conscious of that it's it's i think part and a necessary part a good part of of relationships so we should like go, go with it and 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 struggle it through but i think it's a part but yeah but that was so beautiful i really appreciate that it really was and and i think i think it's what it's part of what infuses life into the relationship these change you know when a relationship is so static it gets boring it's like the way that a system works is that it just repeats itself over it's like a gal gal it goes over and over and over you say the same kind of joke i laugh i say the joke you laugh i say this kind of line you criticize me right it's it just goes round and round and round and when when these changes occur in the individual and they bring that to the relationship it creates new friction which is which is infusing uh you know again if it's a mature couple and they're able to bounce off each other, then they kind of grow by stepping on each other. It's, it's, that's really the beauty of, of a healthy relationship. But, uh, I, and just to Chayasara's point, um, the, you know, I, those, are the, those are the loneliest, her, most hurting people. The ones who, who have these um, uh, growth changes that happen and now they suddenly can't relate. And we find uh, people who are very, very deep. Um, sometimes you have people who in their own perception feel that they're more spiritual, they're on a greater spiritual level than other people and people can't understand them. I mean, the depth of, of loneliness that these people experience is really, really heartbreaking. Okay, we'll go to the next question. As a man, I try to find things to tell my wife, but it always feels like I have nothing to really share. My days are repetitive and not really all that exciting. Is there anything I can do to help so that we can somehow connect. I guess, Vinyamin, if you can help us with that. Yeah, yeah. First of all, he's got to go skydiving one day and then he'll, <laughs> uh, he'll have what to talk about. Uh, uh, he doesn't know what that means. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so yeah, I, I tell a guy like that, you know, um, every time you're going to say something that's, that's new and that's, um, you know, an impression that you had today, each thing that you come home and say about that happened today, you know, I'm giving you a thousand dollars into your bank account, um, a direct deposit right away. You just say, say what happened today. That was, that was, that was, you know, what happened in shul tonight? You know, it's five matter. things that, that, right, right. So, but if you had to say five horrors that and impressions that happened by your marv tonight, and because each of those gave you, suddenly you'd be looking in a different type of way. You'd be noticing, you'd be aware because it goes back to what we were saying before, you know, like no, knowing oneself. If a person, you know, like the, I think the term is adinus hanefesh, you know, in a certain way, if we're, if we're sensitive souls, then we have to refine ourselves. But if we are, then there's, there's, there's things that hit us. There's no day that's, you know, we're day older, the day is different. Um, and the biggest differences are when things are repetitive and they're the same, but that they're so different today. You know, the subtle differences 
that, that's that's really you know uh, what was it like today so if a person's open to what's their what you know who came today how how did the project or the client or myself today something i it doesn't have to be only from a job there's also different parts of a day it could be you know the way i felt in, in, in a day is, is always is, is is fluid and is changing so a person has to know how they're reacting to the, the painting the projection of my life onto my my day's job my day's job it could be a blank you know canvas it's always coming out a different permutation of, of colors if if, if so I to, for a person to start you have to be attuned uh, you know to, to to what the to what that is um so if a person has that a person um you know it, it starts very slow you know what did you feel throughout your day today and then and then to be able to start to, to relate those different things so there's a lot to, to when a person opens his eyes that there's what to notice and I'm not I'm getting more than a thousand dollars I'm 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 being known by my wife I'm sharing I'm opening up which is the the essence of what a relationship is then a person who 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 it's a great question to start with but there are many answers to that question that's something it's it's a it's a it's a wonderful starting point I have not, I don't know it's like yeah, that's a starting point to start then exploring a self and then you, you start to realize there's a lot there's a lot that goes on in in a day there's a lot that goes on in an hour there's a lot that goes on in my train ride I could, I could, you could talk, you could talk for for, for, for a year about your train ride. Well, once <laughs> you're people. on the New York subway, yeah, that's no question. <laughs> okay, yeah. Let's go to the next live question. You're on. Um, okay, so I have trouble um, communicating verbally. I find it much easier to gift um, and then say, let's say, um, I love you and that's why I'm gifting you this item or um, I'll write like, oh, I'm hurt about uh, this or that. Um, this is how I felt. Um, I want to know how can I change that? Is that a problem? And how can I change that to be verbal? Wow, great question. Majid. Yeah, well, you know, uh, um, this, I, I think this is really a psychotherapy question. It's a question of, of what is, you know, you seem to communicate well in the letters. You seem to communicate through gifts that you're trying to tell the person something. And now the question is how to get it from your heart through your mouth. And uh, clearly between your heart and your mouth, there's an obstacle. Now that might be your Adam's apple, your voice box. It might be uh, something in the, the back of your throat or it might be somewhere else. But um, the question you'd want to look at is what is it that's pre preventing me? Or what is it that I'm fearful of or uncomfortable with in expressing these uh, these words verbally? The ones that the same words that you're able to write in a letter. Um, those are things that you can explore in psychotherapy. You may be able to do the work uh, just by by talking it out or writing it out for yourself. Uh, and we may be able to find that uh, it was something that was uncomfortable somewhere earlier in your life for for people who related to you. And so it never became comfortable or you may have been hurt in some way. Uh, but th that's really a question of why is it that I have some, you know, it's kind of like, like in the introduction, we said, just because you learn the skills of communication doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to execute the words. So that's it's a great question. It's a good point. And you probably have a lot of potential if you can already write those words in a letter. Okay, let's jump on to the next question. Is that okay? Sorry, just, it's like speed round. You don't want to cover around. Um, let's, let's do it with the quiet shy person. I know we touched a little bit with the, with the money guy, but it's a little bit different version. I'm a very soft, non-confrontational person. I always struggle to stand up for myself and being assertive. Are there any tips I can implement today to start changing this pattern? Young. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, so, all right. So, so. You know, there's so many levels you can you can answer and you can work with a person. I think it depends even on the therapist you would go to. You know, you could take a very behavioral, um, like a, a practical approach. You know, tell him how to how to sort of position himself. You know, practice with him the behaviors um, that and the, and the tone of voice. You know, take a behavioral approach, and 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 that's you know uh, that's sort of like a you know, a bottom-up approach or whatever we call it, you know, to be able to, to, to you know, Chitsonius will be Meyer, the Panemius, and he'll, he'll, he'll be able to, you know, slowly but surely, uh, you know, do that. 
Um, but, but it all, you know, and, and you can also take a whole very different approach, which is um, to be able to give a person like this to get to the bottom of that, you know, he, he feels for some reason um, that for him to be more invisible or, or, or not have a voice somehow is, is more comfortable. For him to take up actual space in this world um, space doesn't just mean physical space, but you know, energy in, in a room to take up space in this world to breathe oxygen, just like other people. You know, he also has to breathe. Um, that's very, very uncomfortable. It sounds like for this shy uh, person, and 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 that's touching. If you want to do the internal work, that's touching on um, a lot of um, similar to what we were discussing before. You know, being non-existent was for whatever reason helpful, comfortable, and existing was something that uh, either was off limits, scary, dangerous, and therefore that's, that's, that's a, a role that he entered into and uh, it doesn't apply anymore. So for him to start you know, understanding from a very, very deep place within himself that um, you know, if anyone has the right to exist, he's as much of a creation of, of, of of God as, as anyone else, and as is as entitled as anyone else, um, you know. So to get to the 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 not just the beliefs to, to to the early parts of his story, to to start to connect that the beliefs that come along um, with that, um, it's almost like you know if if you also look at it from like a, a systems a family internal family systems, you know. It, it, there's like so many exiles that 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 you know have to you know to have an actual voice. To, to exist, to have needs, have been exiled. Um, and he's very comfortable almost like, like you know, only being this uh, either um, you know, very um, easygoing, you know, uh, low maintenance type of a person. And then, because he's ashamed, but to invite back these old exiles and to be able internally to allow them to have a place and for them, they're all full of shame if he has any needs or if he has a voice, right? So he'll start to realize this very deep old parts of him that have to be reintroduced and have to be allowed. So that's that's great, rich um, internal work. I mean, you can do both of them. You can do the behavioral piece, you can do the internal piece, and they come together and uh, and really uh, uh, you can, can join. Okay, Moshe, I want to throw a question to you. A good friend of mine regularly overstays her visit and doesn't seem to pick up on the social cues when I need her to leave. I do not want to hurt her feelings, but I'm feeling resentful toward her. Yeah, so th this is something that's common. I mean, there's somebody that I like, and at the same time, uh, they push they push past the limits. And so, and so how do I communicate that to her? I don't want to hurt her feelings. If I hurt her feelings, uh, I'm I am afraid. I might feel bad that I am bad because I hurt somebody, and I might lose the friendship. And on the other hand, I'm developing a greater level of resentment each time she's here, and I cannot get her to leave. And so this is a classic example of being able to to have strong communication skills, in which we want to be able to a feel that we have the right and the entitlement not only to ask this person to leave, but also to have this person as a friend. So I, I have the right to have this person leave and I have the right to maintain this friendship. And so when I first feel that assertiveness, I can walk over and I can say, look, you know, there are some times, I, I love when you're here and I love when you come. And then there's sometimes, you know, my, my great, great grandmother you, it was quoted saying that when, when somebody would overstay their, their visit, she would say, Adank farin kumen or Adank farin game. Thanks for coming and thanks for leaving. Right. So so uh, we, we have to be able to say, look, in order for this to really work for me, I need to be able to feel safe enough in my own home that that, you know, it's OK for me to ask you to leave. Would it be OK if I feel that it's time for you to go for me to say, Rifki, is it OK if, if we call it a night? And by doing so, now you've taken something that could potentially be hurtful or insulting and you've created a mutual agreement that this is how it's going to work. I'm going to ask you. And so it's not an insult anymore. It's very straight up. So that's how I would uh, recommend that kind of communication. Just be straight up, but create a mutual agreement as to how it's going to work. And that causes, that creates safety, ongoing safety in our relationship. They re realize that these kinds of safeties in a relationship um, um, create so much safety because I know that it's safe for me to speak to you. And I know that it's safe for you to hear. And, I, and you know that it's safe 
to say something to me and that it's safe for me to hear. That's why the, the relationships become so safe. Rivki will feel that she's unwanted. Yeah, right. So again, if, if, you know, if Rivki has good communication skills, then she might say, I feel, are you saying that I'm unwanted? If she doesn't have communication skills, then the preempting is really where the key is. I love when you come and I love to have you here. And sometimes I get tired early or I get tired quickly, or I have things that I have to take care of, et cetera. So you put, it, put the blame a little bit on yourself. You say, it's, it's about me, but I do love when you're here. And is it okay if, if we uh, approach it in this way? And then you hope for the best. Guys, I know it's very late. I, want to, I just want to get in two more questions, if that's okay, okay? And then we'll go to closing. I know it's late. Sorry, Menachem, don't kill me. Uh, this, this one will be for Biyaman and the, uh, again, if you want to jump, you can jump in, but it's Biyaman and the other two, let's, uh, the last one is, we'll hear from both of you. It's going to be the, we always have to end it off on a powerful note, you know that. Okay, communication with teenagers, the shutdown ones, Biyaman, I'm sure you deal with this every day. What should I do? My teenager comes home, locks himself in the bedroom, the whole Shabbos, he, he stays in the room, shuts down, he throws his garbage out the car window wherever he chooses, he just does whatever he wants. Where do I start communication with him? He's completely mm. his own mm. life. Mm. That's great. Wait, so, so I'm going to give a brief answer, but, but, oh, he's, he's talking so much to you, you know, you have to, you have to, so the, the communication starts with just listening, you know, like they have Google translate, you know, it's from, from one language to the other. So you have to really, you know, translate, Well, oh, he's saying a lot. He's saying how angry he is. He's saying how scared he is. He's saying um, how much he can't talk directly to you. Um, because that's not uh, whatever developed yet. So, so first, first and foremost, listen very, very closely, um, you know, with both ears to those things that are actually being said and accept them and understand that um, first and foremost. Um, and, and if you, that, I, that's step number one in such a situation. If you start that type of way by hearing really all the things that are actually being said, you know, by translating all those things. And then you start to, oh, I can start. I, that's communication. And your kid, by the way, will, will understand very well that, that he's being understood by you. If you start to hear the language that's actually being said, oh, he's angry. Okay, I get it that you're, that, you're, that you're angry. Do you actually say that to him or not say that to him? These are other questions. But I think that that's the starting point of the communication there, that he's saying a tremendous amount and you have to hear a tremendous amount. Okay, we're gonna end up with this. We're gonna end up with this. Moshe, if you can answer first, and then Yaman. Okay, we got we got many different versions of this question. It's just touching the topic. We did a whole share on the topic. We just want to get a very, you know, I'm sorry for asking this question. It's not a fair question, but we'll do it anyway. Okay, the 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 the, the general question is: when dealing with mentally ill people, what's the best way to communicate? As everything I say gets twisted and misconstrued. More deeper question is: my parents are a combination of narcissistic and borderline character traits. The entire family walks on eggshells around them. When they come for Yom Tibor family, Simcha, it's always a disaster. Are there any kind of communication tools or boundaries that actually work? If yes, can you explain it in detail? Moshe. Well, well, first of all, God bless you. Uh, whoever has the parents with, who's narcissistic and borderline, you know, uh, um, I hope that that was a formal diagnosis and it's not the child diagnosing the parent because of the child's own deficits. Uh, but anyway, uh, but be, be that as it may, when, deal, when you talk about mental illness, let's just clarify, the mental illness that you're referring to is mental illness of personality disorder. The, the, um, the, you know, the hallmark of a personality disorder is that they're difficult to get, to get along with. They're difficult to be in a relationship with. So that's like, that's like going into a lion's den from the get-go. You're, you're engaging in a relationship with a person who is objectively this isn't perceptual. This is a person who has relationship problems with everybody. So I would say the first step, and, and again, how many, how many clients have we had, Benjamin, who are children of people with, who you know, suffer with borderline personality disorder, whose, whose own perceptions are so uh, skewed and confused about who they are and what they are, and if they're good or bad, right or wrong, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of and how many therapists have become therapists because they're children's of, children of narcissists or, or people with borderline personality disorder, right? So uh, the, f the first thing is that, that the individual, let's call them the child in this case, needs to be able to be very, very attuned to themselves. What is coming up for them? What, is what are you feeling? Because you're going to have to remove yourself from a tremendous amount of accusation, of perversion, 
of twisting, of, of uh, you know, aligning. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a lot that you have to step away from and you have to be able to take everything with a grain of salt. If, you, if the relationship is gonna to be too personal for you, you're never gonna be able to withstand it because they'll twist and twist and confuse you and intimidate you uh, and you don't know if you're coming or going. So really number one is step, be able to step away from the relationship and look at the other person as it's their stuff. You know, sometimes I like to show some of my clients, I stand up, I say, I stand here and I let the other person go round and round and round and round, but I stay grounded in the same place. So that's number one. Number two is, you know, the boundary question, are there boundaries that work? Well, you know, th there's a rule that, that you know, you, you tell somebody, pick on somebody your own size and, the, and they'll, they'll walk away from you and go pick on someone their own, their own size. So um, there are certain ways that you can communicate um, which, which again, there's, there's, there, it comes with its own conflicts. There's a lot of keep it of aim uh, questions that clients uh, struggle with because they feel like they're being mean, they're being inhumane, they're, they're, they're disrespecting their parents. And a lot of this has to be, has to be spoken over with uh, a competent PISIC before some of these interventions are implemented. But once that's cleared, uh, some, you know, as long, even if it's not parents, let's just say it's friend to friend. There are ways that you can set boundaries and they have to be extremely concrete. This you can do, this you can't do. I won't tolerate this. You can't do this, you can't do this. And again, by, by, by creating concrete boundaries with the other, what you do is they learn how far they can go. Uh, they're gonna, they're gonna, and as much as they're gonna stay in the relationship, it's because they still need you. Okay, so they're gonna have to respect those boundaries because as soon as the boundary is crossed, you hang up the phone and they'll still come back because they need that relationship. So in as much as they're gonna stay in the relationship, a very, very strong, concrete, spoken boundary should be very, very effective and should keep you safe. Back me on. Yeah, yeah, my, my, she, you covered it very well. Um, either I'm clarifying or adding or not adding anything, I don't know. But um, I think that, um, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, you can you can almost look at them. A you you were describing a young child is a combination usually of somewhat narcissistic and and borderline. And and we we stay, you know, they react very differently if we stay firm and centered. There's a certain sense and that they they get um, if you're unmovable and unshakable and don't get drawn into drama. Don't, and that has to be. Um, you know, a, a, it's hard, but, but if there's no reaction and if there's uh, a firmness, then uh, those boundaries, there's a difference between the narcissist and the borderline, how they'll respond to you or engage with you. But that's something that's usually um, very needed. The other thing I would add, you're going through a yantif like that is whether it's your spouse, if, that, if they can play that role if you're married, whether it's a different sibling or whether it's a friend, but to have a person that keeps you, like you were saying, you're going to be, um, you know, manipulated. And so, so like just that, you know, a, a person that's a little bit outside throughout a yanta for throughout, I think that, that can remind you that, you know, you're not living in this alternate universe bubble, but that there's someone that, you know, um, reminds you what normalcy is, is, is going to be helpful throughout that process as well. All right, everybody, let's go to closing now. Um, again, I want to give a big, big thank you to Dr. Biam Tepfer and Moishi Norman for coming here tonight. It gives tremendous chizik. I feel like we started a little communication tonight, like we had a little communication, and I think we're getting there. We, we had so much more to, to talk about. It's like, it's like, you know, I just think the awareness of realizing effective communication and how to really do this is, is, is like the aside. It's the, it's the bottom line. Without that, I don't know, you know, like everybody's answering what percentage it helps your, your, your relationship. I know without it, there's no relationship. That much I can tell you. I don't know how much it could help, but without it, there's nothing. So I really appreciate you guys coming on. I hope you, uh, hope you got, you know, you have like hundreds of people, here, mentioned thousands of people watch it. So again, I appreciate it. Again, every Sunday night, we do the share here at 10 o'clock. Same Zoom ID, different, you know, different topics. So please let everybody know about it. Again, tonight's share is sponsored by Recovery at the Crossroads. Recovery at the Crossroads is the only kosher inpatient treatment center in the tri-state area. They are a licensed co-occurring treatment facility, which means that they are licensed to not only treat substance abuse, but also any other underlying mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, or trauma. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction, feel free to reach out to them at 888-466-5950. Again, next Sunday night um, on uh, June 13th, 
We're going to have an amazing show with Rabbi Daniel Katz from Aish Koda, from Aish HaTorah, sorry, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who is unbelievable. Just go on YouTube, watch some of his videos. I was watching some of them. They were, they were just like off the charts. I don't know. He's like, this guy's on a different planet. Um, you know, bring your popcorn. It's going to be interesting. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to clear out our emotional blockages. And um, please let, you know, it should be an amazing program. Please tell people about it. Join, let family and members know friends. So everybody can be mechazik and get chizik from it. Everything tonight is recorded. It's going to be on www.menachembernfeld.com. If you have any questions to Moshe Norman or Dr. Yom Tepper or anything, please email coachmenachem at gmail.com. We'll forward it to them. To, hopefully they'll respond if they have time. And tonight's share is share number 58. It's all recorded. And if you want to hear it on the phone, the number is 848-777-GROW, G-R-O-W. I want to thank all the advertising sponsors, the Lakewood Scoop, Rabbi Yanganif from Chazak, Chayla Kaplan, Shul Summer from JCN. And uh, let's go to closing words first to Coach Menachem, then we'll be Moshi, and then Yaman. Coach Menachem. Thank you both. Thank you very much. I think tonight's uh, share was really, really deep because when you're talking about communication, it automatically goes to being vulnerable. And uh, vulnerable means going down, deep down into your own kishkas, how you feel. Some people can't open up. There's a reason for that. And, and like we heard this whole night, to be able to figure out what am I feeling and to be okay with that feeling. A lot of, a lot of what we heard tonight and a lot of communication is it's, it's too uncomfortable. I just don't want to go there. Let's just continue what we're doing till now. I don't like this change or whatever it is, but to be able to open up a little bit and you start feeling that uncomfortable feeling and be, be okay with that. Don't run away from it. And obviously, uh, for a lot of people, it's hard. I think for most it is. And if you need a third party, which is always uh, to get somebody to hold your hands while you're trying to figure yourself out. And when you're, you're in a relationship, which, which you, you can't run away from, so you can benefit from getting the help that you need to be able to sit and feel those uncomfortable feelings so that you can learn who you are, so that you can relate to yourself and relate with others. So thank you very much, Ramoichi and Rabin Yaman for the chizik tonight, and everybody should be able to hear and take what they, what will help them in Mitzvah Hashem. Yeah, thank you, uh, Coach Menachem. Thank you, everyone who joined. It was wonderful seeing family and friends and uh, strange names and, uh, and everybody else. Uh, I'd like to just say in closing, you know, we're, we're created as social beings and, and we love people. We love human interaction. We love human touch. We love uh, human connection. And so I, I can't think of anything more satisfying and gratifying in the world than to be able to deeply connect with other people. And the further we deepen our understanding of communication, the ability to be uh, vulnerable, to really check in with ourselves and share parts of ourselves with others and allow them to share parts of themselves with us and to connect and to hold and support the more satisfaction life will bring us. And so I encourage everybody, uh, if, you, if you feel like you struggle with communication or, or a loved one struggles with communication, uh, um, find resources to develop that because it's really, really a game changer and a life changer. Thank you very much. Yeah, Moed, Rabbi Yaman. Yeah, I want to thank you also for, for inviting me. This was such a, a fun and inspiring night to be part of, really, really was. Um, just to, to see all the faces and to talk together, explore together. And the questions were so authentic and genuine. Those that did it live and, and those that sent in um, really, the, you know, I think we modeled over here tonight, good, open, um, honest communication. Um, and, you know, if we go back, those of us that are married, those of us that are not, you know, God willing very soon, um, we say the words, the very, very beginning we rushed with them. Someone reads them by Chasna. The Tznaim has the words Al Yavrichu Al Yalimu Mizu Mizeh. And that simply in English means we shouldn't run and we shouldn't hide one from the other. And I'm telling you, I'm for me personally, um, I'm trying my whole life, and it's a challenge every day in the relationships that I'm in to not run and to not hide because is. And it's not always with the same person, the same thing like we were discussing earlier. It's with the, but to, to look at it as a challenge, to, to be an authentic person, um, ongoing 
because we can always skim and we can always compromise a little bit, but then ultimately the relationship itself stays you know, at, at, a, at a more shallow level. And to push ourselves, to, it, it's, it's the challenge of growing um, personally as people and then our relationships just go to a different dimension, a different level if we don't run and if we don't hide. But it's hard ongoing work every day. Um, that's what I dive in and hopefully uh, we, we all move towards that direction a little bit more after a night like tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Coach Monaco. Everybody, good night. Next week, same time, same night. Good night. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.